You know that in the creation of the world, God is described as having worked. In the first three days, God gave the world form. Light, sky and seas, dry land. And in the next few days, God filled the earth with birds, fish, land animals, and light bearers. That's right, you. God creates man on day six. And in verse 28 of Genesis 1, it says, God blessed them, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I want you to see this first. God commissioned Adam to carry on God's work. Having been created in God's image, Adam is ready to participate in engaging with the world. And as many of you know, two chapters later, the fall occurs. Did you catch that? Work came before the fall. So work was good. It was a part of paradise. And that's a game changer for some of us. Or it should be. Seeing work is inherently good. Especially if we act as if work is something that is burdensome, a necessary evil, or even punishment. Work is not meant to be something to be dreaded, or something we just have to do. But we're made in God's image. If he worked to create the heavens and the earth, then we should see work as a natural, God-given, and God-blessed activity of man. Thankfully, the story doesn't end there. That would be a very sad, short Bible. Um, throughout the Bible, we are pointed to Jesus, who was sent by God to save us and redeem all of creation. The gospel is that we've been saved by God through his son, Jesus Christ, his death on the cross and resurrection. My question for you tonight is, do you believe that? Because if you believe that and profess Christ as Lord, and if the gospel changes everything, then the gospel ought to change your heart and your mind about this one thing called work or school. Yes, Jesus came to save us, but in a fuller sense, he came to redeem all of creation. I need you to hear that. We've got to see our work as part of God's plan for redemption of all of creation. So we have salvation. We've been saved from our flesh, from the world, from the enemy. But have you ever asked what you were saved for? Because when we start to truly believe the gospel and the work that God has given us is to participate with him in his creation and cultivation of the world, then we can be free to pursue many different kinds of work. So let's start here. Let's stop making distinctions between vocational ministry and marketplace ministry. They're actually both full-time ministry. And I want you to think about the words that we use to describe vocational ministry as full-time ministry. I'm pretty sure if you follow Jesus, aren't we all in full-time ministry? In both Christian workplaces and secular workplaces, we have lots of opportunities to glorify God. So before we came to Azusa, uh, three years ago in 2015, uh, we actually lived in Santa Barbara for about eight years. And one of my most vivid um, memories of living in Santa Barbara was of Luke, who is my, uh, was then my one and a half year old son in the trash truck. Trash trucks came barreling down our street nearly every day because we had three different kinds of trash cans. We had the blue ones for recycling and the brown ones for yard waste and the black ones for trash. And then there was a large apartment complex across the street with those large dumpster bins and kind of like the ones probably around your apartment complexes. And it was really crazy because you can imagine one and a half year old Luke was in truck heaven. We had trash trucks every day on our street. And when we heard a trash truck coming, we would sprint, meaning Luke would run to the front door and either my husband, Matt, or I would quickly scoop him up and we would go out to the curb to watch and to wave. It didn't matter if Luke had pants on. That's my son, not my husband. <laughs> or if we were still in our pajamas. Sometimes it was very early in the morning and we would sprint out to the curb. One day my husband, Matt, asked the trash truck driver uh, how often he was greeted as he was uh, like from my son, Luke. His response, every other block. What an incredible thing. That though society would probably look down on this as menial and dirty work, 
that he was seen as a hero to nearly every kiddo under the age of five, enjoying cheers, waves, and adoration on the job, let me repeat, every other block. In God's kingdom, as he seeks to redeem the world, the trash truck driver's job is just as important and God-honoring as mine, working as a professor at a Christian university. Let's not elevate vocational ministry over corporate work. Let's not elevate nonprofit work over for-profit work. Let's not decide what work has more value to God. Because if Jesus came to redeem all of creation and God asks us to participate with him in this redemptive work, then there also should not be a meaningful distinction between paid and unpaid work. It's strange because there are so many people who work 40 plus hours, some even 60 or 80. And when you ask them how they serve the Lord, they say they volunteer at church and they give financially to church, to charities, to missionaries. Shouldn't we seek to glorify God every day with whatever he has us doing, whether or not it's paid? So in addition to my now four-year-old son, Luke, my husband, Matt, and I have another little guy, Theo, who turned two in October. But I would say in the last week, he really became two. I always thought I actually would stay home with kids or at least work only part-time. But because of a perfectly timed job opportunity, the leadership of my husband and God's provision, I get to work. Sure, still work. There are days that are rather annoying, very frustrating. And do I do work that I don't want to do? Yes. But I get to work. Because if I'm really honest, being a college professor is by my easier job by like a mile. Without a doubt, working with all of you people, not actually you, but you know, you college people, is a whole lot easier than disciplining and caring for two toddler boys day in and day out. Sometimes you give me a run for my money. But what I'm learning is that my, both my paid work as a PhD holding faculty member and my unpaid work as a mom, as a wife, as a friend, as a volunteer, all of them present multiple opportunities for me to glorify God in my work. And I should not compare them one to another. I must not choose to sacrifice my friendships or my relationships or commitments we've made to lead a growth group at our church on the altar of my work. But I also should not sacrifice the quality of my teaching or my research because I was investing in relationships and spending time with friends. I have important work to do in both my home and my office. But either work on their own would be perfectly sufficient unto the Lord. The Lord gives us enough mercy to manage all that he has asked of us. In fact, if I told you that I started my master's PhD program at UC Santa Barbara in 2007, if you had told me in 2007 that in 2018 I would teach at APU, I would be married, I would have two toddler boys and work full time, I'm pretty sure I would have said, thanks God, but too much. I'm out. Isn't that cool how God is so faithful to only give us just a little bit more than we think we can handle? Because if we actually knew exactly what he had planned for us five years from now, ten years from now, can I be so bold to say that we actually probably couldn't handle it? I know that I couldn't. When Luke was six months old, I was working at UCSB and an acquaintance from our church uh, asked me like, hey, how's it going? You're like a mom, you've got a new kiddo, you're working full time, how's that going? And I looked at her and I said, I think I'm fine. Because who I was talking to was a woman who had three boys under the age of four and ran her own business. I thought, no, 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 I'm good. Like in comparison, I'm good. You've got a lot more going on. And she said the most freeing thing to me. She said, you know, Courtney, um, what if we actually believed that we all only had 80% of what we need? That as each milestone, as we grow, as we move forward in life, that God increases our capacity, but we're actually always still short, even on our best days, on 20%. And so he said, she said to me, um, that means I can look at you and I can have a lot of freedom to say, I see you, and that's a lot. And so I can look at my students students just like you, and I can say, wow, you guys are handling a lot. You're managing a lot. And, and refuse or reject the idea that you can look at me and go, wow, she's managing a lot, and I just have this. No, nope. God sees you, and he sees me, and we don't need to compare what we've got. 
What I'm telling you is think about how it is that God wants to redeem all of creation. Think about the ways in which we can use our paid work and our unpaid work, our vocational ministry and our marketplace ministry, our nonprofit work, our for-profit work. Can all of these be opportunities to glorify the Lord? In fact, I've really gotten excited about this term called whole life discipleship, which begs the question, how do I follow Jesus in every hour, in every part of my life? How does the whole of my life represent a posture of humility before him? Okay, what does this mean for you? What does this mean for you when you graduate? Any graduates this spring? Let me see you. Okay. Uh, anyone graduating this year? So December? Do I have any December grads? Yes, I see you. It's good. You're not alone, pal. Okay? But all of us, what are we in college for? Hopefully you're going to graduate, right? I'm rooting for you. We want you guys, uh, professors, we want to get you guys out of there too. Okay? We're on board. Okay, what does this mean for you? If you get this idea that our work is part of God's redemptive work, what does this mean for you and what does it mean for the work that you pursue after you graduate? So there's this awesome early 20th century British writer. I know you don't generally think about early 20th century British writers as awesome. Okay, but there's this woman named Dorothy Sayers. And Dorothy Sayers said this, the church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him not to be drunk and disorderly in his, in his leisure hours and to come to church on Sundays. But what the church should be telling him is this, that the very first demand his religion makes upon him is that he should build good tables. When I first read that years and years ago, that message really resonated with me, the idea that we ought to pursue darn good work, to pursue excellence, because as she says, a building must be good architecture before it can be a good church. A painting must be well painted before it can be a good sacred picture. And work must be good work before it can be God's work. No matter your major or your intended career field, all of us as the body of Christ, let's pursue work in all sectors of society. Believing that and then acting on the belief that God wants to redeem all of creation. No matter your position or title, whether you have one or not, let's be the most creative and diligent people in the world. Because in our work, we get to participate with him, the diligent creator of the universe. What does that mean then? It means that I actually want some of you to go into government government really broken right now? Yeah. I need you in government, not because there's a Christian agenda, but because we take the Holy Spirit with us. And I want smart, thoughtful, intelligent people who have studied and are intellectually equipped to engage in really big decisions that affect a lot of us. I want you in healthcare. I want you in the entertainment industry. I want you in jury rooms. Can I just say for a second, do not try to get out of jury duty. Because I need you in there. Because people's lives matter. And I want you to, and when I teach small group communication, and we're talking about decision making in small groups, I especially want those people in there. I need to know that we're being equipped, that you're being trained to do really important things. Do not bow out. That's a cool opportunity. Be diligent and creative in the music, in art, and in storytelling. Where are my, where are my art creative people? Let's do it. You're always nervous about this. You're always nervous about it. My husband's a web developer, a graphic designer. He's an introvert. He's nothing like me. And he would probably do the same thing. Be diligent and creative in creative industries, but be diligent and creative in decision making. Be diligent and creative in product innovation. I have no idea whether or not the iPhone was created by a Christian, and I don't care, but it is a glorious device. Can you just for a moment recognize this, this doctrine of common grace that we can not worship the iPhone, but marvel at God's creation and the ways in which he used human minds to create such technology? We don't have to talk about Christian movies. They're generally terrible. (laughs) 
Why? Why? Why are they promoted in our churches and in our youth groups and all these things to go out and support Christian movies? No, go write really good stories with really complex plot lines that have interesting characters. Do we believe that we can depict the brokenness and the glory that is to be seen on, in the world? Go do these things. And you don't have to be a Christian movie maker, filmmaker, <laughs> movie maker, <laughs> filmmaker. Okay, you don't have to be a Christian, fill in the blank. Just go be good at what you do and carry the gospel with you. Can we be diligent and creative in bodily health and in healing, in spiritual counseling and in vocational ministry? Diligent and creative. Last summer, the pastor of our church, uh, Foothill Church, some of you guys go there, uh, was teaching from the book of Galatians. And he suggested that through the whole of our lives, that we live out and preach who it is that we serve and the grace that we enjoy. But what gospel are we preaching? What are we demonstrating as true or false about the person of Jesus Christ by the whole of our lives, including our work? Do your work and your life appropriately elevate Christ and his work in the world? Part of my salvation story is that I met Jesus as a junior at USC in a sorority of all places. Unlikely story, I know, but creative God, right? Uh, where are my junior, where are my sophomore, any freshmen or sophomores in the house? Okay, I appreciate you. So here's, here's a really cool part, is that when I was sitting in your seat, not here, but when I was a freshman or a sophomore in college, I did not know Jesus. There's hope for a lot of you. I mean all of you, but you know, there's... <laughs> I met Jesus in a USC sorority of all places. And I came to know Christ because there were smart, ambitious fraternity guys and sorority girls who were doing things with their lives. That I saw their work and I wanted to know why and how they did what they did. Because they were diligent. They had purpose, they had vision, and their good work reflected an incredible creator. Does your work reflect an incredible creator? Let me suggest to you that both the work that we produce and the way in which we do it reflect what or who we worship. And it has to be both. Understanding this theology of work means that it can, we can no longer be satisfied with just being the nice people at the office. It's not just about being nice. There are plenty of super nice people. With Christ, let's do big things and little things faithfully. Calling something of mediocre quality Christian inadvertently communicates that we serve a fairly mediocre God. Remember what Dorothy Sayers says, work, excuse me, work must be good work before it can be God's work. Far too often Christian workers, even in those gospel-centered organizations, settle for mediocrity saying things like, God's grace is going to cover this. Oh, guys, that's gross. No. Can we pursue our work with excellence? Let's not do mediocre work and bank on the Lord shoring up where we lack. But darn good work done with thoughtfulness, bodily strength, right heart, through the Holy Spirit, is indeed a righteous sacrifice unto the Lord. To best reflect our diligent creator, let's free ourselves and others to pursue excellent work in all sectors of society. When I taught at UC Santa Barbara, uh, it was uh, I happened to be there when uh, the shooting in Isla Vista happened. And I was so thankful in a lot of ways that it wasn't just that I was a nice professor. That I had people out my door who said, this is one of the hardest classes I've ever taken and I appreciate that. And gosh, what a cool thing. Now that I'm like the model citizen in everything, please trust me on that. But the idea that you can do really good work and that people can recognize that and then they want to know why. Then they want to know why. Okay, I'm hoping at this point you're on board to do good work. Can I get a, hey, yeah? yeah. Okay. But I want to make sure I make myself really clear that darn good work does not mean that it is without hardship. It's really funny. Culture, and especially Christian culture, have communicated pretty unrealistic expectations for us to perfectly find our calling and live out our unique gifts in our work. 
when the reality is God sends his beloved people into dark places, and many of you will be purposely placed, and some of you already have, in jobs, in volunteer organizations, in families, and in cities that won't seek your good. Maybe in your first job after graduation, you don't feel like you're living out your calling or your strengths aren't being fully used, or you don't have people in your work that share your beliefs. Maybe you don't have a supervisor who's invest it, who is invested in you. Remember this, God is sovereign and he's good and he's for you. And he has really important work to do with him, sometimes in hard work with difficult coworkers in dark places. So when we think about vocational and marketplace ministry, nonprofit and for-profit work, paid and unpaid work, can you begin to see God's vision for how he's working in the world? I have this really crazy story about a friend of mine. His name's Jason, and he actually goes to this church. So it's really cool to talk about him here. A um, friend named Jason, and he, uh, he's married to a colleague of mine at APU, and he's got a, an 18-year-old son and I think a 14-year-old daughter. He used to work as a prosecutor. He's a lawyer. He used to work as a prosecutor, and a couple of years ago decided that he was now going to be a public defender. Now, he loves Jesus, and a lot of people look at him and go, what are you doing as a public defender? What are you doing defending people who don't uh, have a legitimate defense frankly. And my husband actually asked him, like, do you actually believe these people are innocent? Or are they guilty? Like, where are you in all this? And he says, no, 100%, they're all guilty. This is what he said. He goes, 100%, they're all guilty. And they've acknowledged it. He goes, here's my Christian ethic. My job is to make sure that the prosecutors are doing their job. That should be pretty thought-provoking to you. And if you ever read the book of Daniel, Daniel does some pretty gnarly things that on the surface, most Christians would go, ew, I, you can't really be that. You're not actually a good Christian, right? You went to like the school for sorcery. And a lot of you, like imagine if um, one of your friends was like, yeah, I love Jesus and I'm going to go to the school for hypnotherapy. Some of you would be like, eh. Sure, sure about that? Sure about Jesus? There's something that's off. But what if actually following Jesus in our work? <laughs> I don't know what that was. Sorry. What if, what if we actually started to believe that what our work looks like is actually not about us? It's not about what is fulfilling for us. It's not about what is going to serve us or even the best way that we can serve the Lord. Here's how I want to serve you. I would say that most of my paid work takes place over coffee and in office hours. And if I could get a university to pay me to just have office hours and coffee with students, that would be awesome. But for now, I teach and I research and I get to speak at things like this. And most of it is in order to non-creepily get more students into my office because I'm about mentoring and I'm about equipping and I want to be about seeing Jesus lived out authentically. And my students hate it when I say this, or at least they give me a funny look when I say, I actually don't love being a professor. Like I don't love the classroom, which many of you are like, even you are kind of like, what? But that's what she does. No, it's not what I do. Do you see that it's entirely possible that you could live out your gifts and live out your callings and do other things that you happen to also be good at? What if we saw our work as part of the Great Commission? All of us in various sectors of society. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power with the, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Yes, go and make disciples of all the nations. Take the gospel to the ends of the earth, into remote jungles, remote bushes in the jungle, to unreached people but unreached people are also sitting in cubicles in high-rise buildings in downtown LA. 
The Great Commission is for missionaries locally, nationally, internationally, but also for the missionaries who work in the marketplace and drive an hour to work each way. And I um, have cousins who live in Australia and they just acquired a vineyard. Vineyards take how long to cultivate? Generations. Long, long time. But he said, build homes. This was not an Airbnb. Okay, we're not just like going for a couple days and then we're out. This is build homes, live in them, plant vineyards. This is, you're gonna be here for a while. Marry there. It says multiply and do not decrease. So here's uh, some of the stuff that I researched. It turns out that there is uh, some you might remember. A recession in 2008, 2009, major economic crisis. Well, it turns out being in the higher ed sort of industry, if you will, we know already, in fact, university administrators across the nation are already talking about a massive decrease in college age eligible students in the year 2026. Why? It turns out that under immense stress in a lot of financial uncertainty, people stopped having kids. There were very few, comparatively speaking, much fewer babies born in 2008 and 2009. That under such stress, our natural inclination is to say, I have so much uncertainty, I cannot bring people into the world, but what does Jeremiah 29 say? It says in the midst of being a minority culture in a foreign land with no king, no temple, and no land, I want you to stay there for a long time and I want you to marry there and I want you to have kids. I want you to multiply and do not decrease. Do you hear how counterintuitive that seems? Last verse, verse seven, but seek the welfare of the city where I sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare, you will find your own. When I took this graduate theology course, the only theology course I've ever taken, when I took this graduate theology course on a lived theology of work, the professor basically said, when God said to his exiles, seek the welfare of the city, where I've sent you into exile, it was as if you were telling the Jews to seek the good of Berlin. Oh man, that sits heavy. So like, what do we do? What does that mean? And how does that relate to what it is that I'm talking about, this theology of work? Well, here at Cal Poly and with crew, I hope that you are getting opportunities to do at least two things. One, I hope that you've grasped in your heart and your mind that your security, your status, and your purpose all come from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Nothing and no one else. Because when we're secure in our identity in Him and our status is that we're known by Him, then our purpose is that we make him known. Is that the gospel? Is that our job? Yeah. But second, I hope you've packed an intellectual suitcase for engaging with the world through your work. Understanding that your academic and your co-curricular training help you to think critically about the world around you. Yes, I realize that I'm a professor and I'm telling you to invest in the theories and the skills and the practices that equip you to be the most creative and diligent people in the world. Here's why. Let me go back to exile. This exilic discipleship requires an, intellect, an intellectual sophistication. It's not just about being nice people in the office. Do you see it? Then in the midst of exile, in a world that will not profess Christ, how is it that we act in the world? This is not going to be a triumph until Christ returns. But in the midst of it, can we walk as exiles knowing that we will be in the minority culture, knowing that people will not likely profess Christ in a lot of workplaces that you will go into. But can you know internally that you are saved by Jesus, have your security not wrapped up in your work or your title or your position, your company, none of those things, but then serve out of that sure identity? What would it look like if, that, if we took that seriously? What if we started preparing to enter those concrete jungles of corporate America with the same heart and mind as those entering remote jungles abroad? Are you willing to sacrifice your reputation for the sake of the gospel? Like missionaries abroad, are you willing to go into workplaces? And are you willing to stay in those workplaces that don't seek your good and don't worship your God? Can you do that for the sake of the gospel? 
It can be so tempting to believe what the world believes, that our work should be the place that we find most fulfillment. Goodness, you'll spend a lot more hours at work than you will with the people that you love the most. Sorry if that's bad news for you. But in the Christian world, we can also easily begin to believe that work is a place where we most fully live out our callings and share the gifts that God has given us to share with the, the world around us. Want to be a difference maker? Want to actually make a difference? One who takes the gospel into unreached people groups in remote jungles and concrete jungles? Here's how you do it. Be patient and present. Those who go, those who persevere, those who stay in remote jungles and concrete jungles, in villages and jobs and industries that don't seek their good, those that persevere in those places and stay true to the gospel are a critical part of the Great Commission. You want to make a difference in the world? Go into the world. God did not save us to huddle together and keep to ourselves. And if you're called to the pulpit or the church or parachurch work, God bless you. Steward this message as an exhortation to equip and send out others with a robust theology of God's plan to redeem the world through their work. Go or send or both. Those are your options. I work at a place like APU. What would happen if a place like APU, all of us, faculty and staff, were really on mission to send rather than to huddle? What if crew, Pomona Valley, was about sending yes to vocational ministry and yes to marketplace ministry? Yes into paid work, yes into unpaid work. What if you understood that your job is to go or to send or both. Those are your only options. So whether you're a goer or a sender, see your work as an expression of your identity in Christ. Don't seek from work that which only God provides, your security, your status, and your purpose. When we know where our security, our status, and our purpose come from, then we are freed from others' opinions and evaluations of us. We stop expecting work to be the source of our identity. And this frees us to be that minority culture, not seeking dominance, but persevering faithfully in workplaces that don't seek our good with the assurance of that which Christ promises. What does that mean for you now? Here in week two, spring quarter? This college season is mostly about cementing your identity in Jesus. His death and his resurrection and equipping you with that intellectual suitcase to engage the world. And when we do our part, all of us, you as students, we as faculty, your crew staff, you're prepared to work as an expression of your identity in Christ. So press in. If you've caught this vision for participating with God in redeeming the whole world through all sectors of society, then you must buy into your education. Don't fall into the trap of believing that only your volunteer work or your discipleship group, or your involvement in student life or crew counts to the glory of God. All of that for sure counts, but your classwork counts too. I think some of you approach your education like my son Luke did while packing and moving homes last summer. He wanted help, and so I gave him a box and asked him to fill it with whatever he thought that he would need in the new house. So 20 minutes later, he brought his box back to me, half full, three train tracks, two trains, four cars, a book, a bouncy ball, and a stuffed zebra. No clothes, no bath soap, no bed sheets. I think you get the point. In his short-sightedness, he decided what he thought he needed and didn't even fill it to the brim. Are you getting where I'm going with that? I'm pretty sure that there are at least a few of you who approach your classes like that. You love Jesus, but you don't see value in this particular class. So you skip it or skate by. You decide that this particular assignment is busy work, so you give it half the attention it deserves. Or you read a journal article or textbook chapter only to figure out what's on the exam. Can you be faithful in the little things? Sorry, that was probably convicting for some of you. But can you be faithful with those little things? Can you read that article or chapter, trusting that in and of itself, that's good work, regardless of what's on the exam, 
Because even as a professor, I'll tell you, your grades don't actually matter as much as you think that they do. For some of you, you need to hear the other message, which is, this is about stewardship. Sorry again. If your work is an extension of God's work, then even the one-page reflections and the mundane textbook readings are opportunities to glorify God in your work today, this week, and next week. Do not fall into the trap of short-sightedness. In God's sovereignty, do we believe, Romans 8, 28, that he will use everything together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Do not miss out on the equipping that is possible this season. How? How do I take this vision for good work and practically implement it? Yes, now I feel a little bit more compelled to do my reading because some professor from APU told me to do it. But how do I do this practically? Beyond the little things, as I call them, one, stand firm and do darn good work. My students hear me say this often, you don't have to have a position, you just have to have a place. And in that place, do darn good work. Don't rely on a title or a company or employment at a big four or top five firm to validate your identity and your worth. Because if I'm really honest, I go to national conferences myself, national communication association conferences, and my little name tag says is East Pacific University. And if I'm really honest, it's really just a small dinky school. Can we be humble about those things where they don't actually matter? Because what I'm getting to steward is far more than what someone else can think about the work that I'm doing at a small Christian liberal arts institution in Azusa, California. If you truly believe that your identity and your worth come from Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, then you can embrace your place. A friend and a recent APU grad, actually Abby knows her and uh, my friend Bailey, uh, this recent APU grad has been in my husband and my church uh, uh, small group, growth group, and she spent the first year outside of graduation working at Starbucks in her hometown, much to her disappointment. But while the rest of her coworkers complained about their work, she sought to do the best darn work she could. She was joyful. She knew customers' names and stories and orders. She understood the different hints and aromas that were in different varietals of coffee. She went the extra mile to make things right. Yeah, some might look down on her, and say that she was just working at Starbucks with a college degree. But I want to believe that she reflected God's glory in that place. You might not have your dream job right out of college. I didn't. In fact, many of you might not even know what that dream is. That's okay. Do something. Almost anything. Trust that God uses all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And then remember, you don't have to have a position. You just have to have a place. And in that place, do darn good work. Second, when you do that darn good work to the glory of God, working as an expression of your sure identity in Christ, embracing that exilic perspective, 1 Peter 3.15 says, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. If you're doing that darn good work, the work that you produce and the way in which you're doing it, if you don't worship the gods of this world, people are gonna ask you what your deal is. Except they won't say, um, excuse me, can you give me a reason for the hope that you profess? No, you'll usually get something like this. Are you particularly religious? That happened to a former student of mine in a workplace, went and had uh, lunch with a coworker. He said, oh, you went to APU. Are you particularly religious? Okay, how many of you evangelical Christians go, I hate the word religious. I don't know how to respond to that. So like, are you particularly religious? What would you say? Heck yeah, or that. But the rest, but the rest of you are kind of like, I don't like that question. Don't shy away from how the question's being asked. Instead, can we be bold to say you love and follow Jesus? Because if by God's grace, you're doing the work in a way that causes someone to ask, they probably already know 85 things about you. They know how you do your work. They know how you treat others. They know what you do when you're stressed. They know how you spend your weekend because they ask you every Monday. They ask you what's meaningful to you. They know how you take your coffee. 
So when they ask you if you're particularly religious or why you do the things that you do, be bold, recognizing that the 86th thing that they know about you will probably not negate the 85 things that they knew before, especially if you do it with gentleness and respect. As a minority culture, as an exile, if you're doing things to the glory of God, you have the opportunity opportunity to be light bearers in some pretty dim places. Exile is a place where we're realigned with the purposes of God and identity as God's people. When we understand workplaces from that exilic perspective, I think we can learn a lot from our brothers and sisters who live and serve as missionaries abroad and who also willingly embrace their place as exiles. I have some really great friends who graduated from UC Santa Barbara, were really active with crew and got really excited about the Arab Gulf beautiful part about these friends. They lived upstairs from us in this little duplex, Kim and Garrett upstairs, my husband Matt and me downstairs. Turns out we had um, our first kids, uh, her, their little girl Eliza was born five days before my son Luke. So we were pregnant at the same time. Number two, we were seven days apart. So our number two, and they have a number three, but they are praying, have been for the last 10 to 15 years about going to the Arab Gulf. And they have a prayer team and they've got support and they've got people who say when they are experiencing spiritual warfare, when they are in the trenches, when they are trying to figure out how to engage some of these really hard conversations, they have a team. What would happen if we all did go out into the world? Can we get people who can pray fervently for our context and before they go and then continuously as we land that job? Missionaries abroad assemble these sending teams who pray on their behalf and encourage them to persevere in really challenging settings. Pray for your workplaces now. Pray continuously once you land that job and assemble a sending team, mentors and friends who can encourage you to remember that your security is in Christ, your status is that you're known by him and your purpose is to make him known in dimly lit places. It's no wonder there are a lot of Christians who want to be out in the world and decide they want to come back to the comfort of of Christendom. They want to work in a parachurch organization and they want to work in a church or they want to work in vocational ministry. There's nothing wrong with that. But what if we actually all went out in the world and the people who worked in our ministries were called to do that? Okay, let me talk about rest back to Genesis. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Repetition in scripture usually means this is important. God worked with diligence and creativity and then he rested content in that finished work. If work and rest are seen through that Genesis lens, then work is good and rest is designed for us to recharge and go back to doing that good work. We shouldn't think that only our leisure time is good and that work is necessary for us to make money so we can experience life on the weekends. Let's not have a case on the Mondays and celebrate hump day and root to Friday. Work and rest and work and rest. It's all supposed to be good. Want to be a difference maker? Be a diligent worker who rests well. Rested, diligent Christians are rare and downright countercultural. Be rested, diligent, creative Christians following a God who modeled just that. What a powerful affirmation of the gospel and the God that we serve. Let me pray. Lord, thanks. Thanks for the good work that you've given and are giving these students and staff to do here in Pomona Valley. I pray that we would grow more and more into the likeness of your son Jesus, working creatively and diligently in all sectors of society, resting well, playing hard, becoming equipped difference makers, all for your glory. Help us to grow in awe of you and your plan to redeem the whole world through the work of our hands, our heads, and our hearts. 
In Christ's name I pray, amen.